With respect to the different treatments, this is one of the areas of prostate cancer that I think is really confusing for patients and clinicians because we know on one hand, it's the number one cancer in the men um, for solid organ malignancies, and it's the number two cause of cancer-related deaths in men. But that being said, the majority of men with prostate cancer don't really need to be treated, at least initially, because when we think about the vast number of biopsies we do annually, which are millions, and the fact that most prostate cancer that's detected is relatively low grade and low stage, a lot of men are what's called active surveillance and it's a monitoring program. Time to embrace change and be about that life. This is Dr. Bass with the About That Life podcast, the podcast about life or living intentionally forever. As you all know, September is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. Now, prostate cancer is not an issue that only affects one community, but unfortunately, African-Americans are disproportionately affected. They have higher rates of death, higher rates of later detection. And then oftentimes when we look at screening and other strategies that have at least, I would say, leveled the playing field or improved that, we don't see it. Well, today, as much as you know, I, I am passionate about fitness and nutrition and lifestyle guiding many of our therapies. One important tactic is to screen and to at least be evaluated. And I have uh, one of my friends who is one of this nation's leaders or one of the pioneers and pioneers makes him sound old, but he is not old. Uh, one of the pioneers of really evaluating uh, the prostate and, and doing uh, advanced robotic techniques in, in who is a, a giant in his field. And he also enjoys volleyball and other things that we'll get to that, that he wrote on his CV. But I will introduce to some and present to others, Dr. Dieter Runo. How are you, my friend? How are you doing today? Morning, Travis. I am doing great. I appreciate being here and just having the opportunity to catch up. Uh, but also talk about something that I hold near and dear to my heart. Wonderful. Well, you know, I'm glad to see you. you're looking well. And we we chatted a little earlier and we got to catch up. I mean, it's been way too long. Um, I can remember you over at that other school that that does medical <laughs> over at Duke. He's a he's a he's a Duke guy, but I, I don't hold that against him at all. He was uh, a great mentor and example, even for me, not in the space of, of surgery while I was over at Chapel Hill. But, you know, folks want to know, I mean, because we, we know urology, right? And we hear about that. But what made you go into medicine and, and urology? Tell me to tell us a little bit about that first. You know, for me, medicine was an opportunity to uh, use my hands and to be able to serve people. Uh, I always tell people probably Getting into medicines for me dated back to when I was a child and really wanted to play video games. And uh, where I grew up, we weren't getting video game uh, systems. That wasn't on the uh, on the agenda for my family. They're like, no, we're not buying you Atari <laughs> systems and things like that. Uh, so one of the things that I did when I was uh, in high school was started to learn how to program uh, before computer programming really became a thing. Um, and it really was a goal was to write video games so that my brother and my friends and I could play because we knew we weren't going to get those video game systems. Um, and being able to write software at an early age was something that was just really fun because it was like taking math, but then being able to create something out of it. And I think that really drove my passion for thinking about robotics, technology. So fast forward. Uh, you know, when I went to, to college, I said, you know, really what I want to do is something with my hands, something to be able to help people, something to give back. Um, and I thought medicine was a nice way of doing that. So that in urology was just one of the areas in medicine, it really is replete with technological advances. So for me, that was just, um, an opportunity and a lot of it was just serendipity. Wow. No. And, and that's one. And I like how you, cause I tell people they, they have these grand ideas of what they want to do and who they want to be. And when they come to me for mentorship, I say, well, what do you like doing? They're like, what do you mean? What do I like doing? I said, what do you like doing? Because at the end of the day, it is easier to exist in a space that is natural and what you like forever than it is to try to 
fit yourself into a space that you think is is the right move for you. Now, now I didn't say how old he was, but he he just said Coleco Vision in Atari. So, you know, <laughs> I didn't say that. He did. So that gives you an idea. But but even from those early days of, of coding on his Commodore 64 or what, and that's what I had. I I because we didn't get video games either. And so I had to learn. I I didn't even know I was coding, but I'd be able to make a dot go across the screen and you'd have to write three pages of code just to do that. But I was excited because I created a cartoon tune, so to speak. Now, I know, you know, I have viewers of, of spanning all ages, but talk a little bit about that path in urology, because one of my um, former mentees, and as much as I tried to make him a cardiologist, I could not pull him away from urology. He's actually doing his urology uh, residency uh, to Karis Neal. So he went to uh, Morehouse, great young man. And I kept telling him, you know, hey, you, you'd be a great cardiologist. Hey, you know, cardiology could use some great hands, but you guys took them. So talk to folks about um, urology and that practice and, and what it is so that as people are thinking of, uh, and we'll talk about prostate cancer a little bit later, but as people are are framing what they do and, and how they approach it, they understand who they're talking about. So talk about that path and, and what a urologist does. Great. And I'm going to echo your comments. I think one of the most important things is for people to follow their passions uh, in a sense, because that's really going to fuel and drive where you end up. Urology is essentially um, the medical and surgical specialty that deals with the male genital urinary system and the female urinary system. And it sounds fancy, but basically we deal with things like kidneys, kidney stones, prostates, prostate mm -hmm. cancer, enlarged prostates and things like that. I didn't have a clue about urology was when I first started out <laughs> in my academic pathway. And I'll tell you, that's um, another reason why it is so important to follow your passion. Kind of as we talked about, for me, it was being able to figure out how to use technology. I love science and technology. That was something that I thought about when I was a kid. I remember I used to have my little telescope and pull it out and look at the stars. So for me, it was always about science and technology. Urology was really um, because... When I went to college and started thinking about going to medical school, uh, and one of the nice things being about that school, and we talked about in North Carolina, we won't, we won't go into specific names, <laughs> uh, but uh, I had some great mentors. And one of my first mentor uh, was a Nigerian uh, professor of surgery at Duke. And he was a general surgeon, and he tried to recruit me to general surgery because that was his love. Uh, and as I started going through uh, medical school and getting an opportunity to see some research. Cause that wasn't anything that I really knew about before that. Um, you know, it was really that great mentorship that drove me to solidifying my decision for a career in surgery. And at first I thought I might go into cardiothoracic surgery, but really what changed it for me, um, was the urologist, uh, and I didn't know really what urology was, but they were just, they were really content with what they did. Um, they taught me and said, hey, you know, you know what urology is? No, I don't know what that is. Come on to go to rounds with us. Let's show you what we do, mm -hmm. the operations, the clinic and things like that. It was really the first time that I really felt a sense of clinical community in, in medicine where I was like, well, I could really see myself doing this. These guys like what they do. What they do seems really interesting. Um, and as I learned more and more about it, I realized there were a number of conditions that affected African-Americans. And I was like, wow, that might be a way that I can give back. Um, you know, urology is a really small field when you think about overall, you know, the number of physicians that go into it, but it has a huge impact uh, because so many people ultimately need the services. So urology was something I ultimately learned about as I had the opportunity to be mentored by people in medicine. And, you know, as we talk today, I'm always going to go back to mentorship, 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 uh, because it's so important in what we do. No, I agree. And and I like how, because that was how I kind of picked cardiology, because I knew I, I loved the physiology of the heart. I appreciated the pathophys. I knew that it was the number one killer of all people, not just uh, African Americans or anyone, but everyone worldwide, right? And and but I I was intrigued by surgery, right? But it was after a long surgical case, and uh, I look over and I see this doctor who's got on slacks and some loafers, and he was very well put together, and he comes over, pats me on my shoulder, and says, "Hey, how you doing?" 
Travis? And I said, oh, I'm fine. We just got out of a eight hour uh, case. You know, we did this and, and I'm dripping in sweat and in my scrubs. And he's like, oh, OK, well, I just did what you all did for six people and had lunch with my wife. See you later. I said, whoa, whoa, what, 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 what do you? He said, oh, yeah, I opened three arteries. And, and that was at the early point where structural uh, heart disease in terms of the interventionalist, you know, doing ASD repairs and various things like that. And so he just told me, hey, I just did what you did on eight people, had lunch and, you know, heading out to watch my kids game or something like that. And I looked at him, I said, well, what are you doing? And he said, I'm doing interventional cardiology. And that's what got me involved. And in, in over time, you know, now cardiology has so many sub sub specialties, which I know that urology does as well. You can pretty much pick the type of cardiologist that you want to be for the most part. But, you know, you. You touched on something there also. You said, I wanted to give back and, and help people. And many of the folks that I mentor, that's that's their goal, but they don't know the right um, entry point. Now, for you, you know, you talked about urology. You talked about, you know, so how did, well, you mentioned it and said it affects a lot of people in our community. So were you talking specifically about prostate cancer or broadly about urologic issues? Because I know, um, you know, uh, dysfunctional bladder issues. I don't, I don't think they're specific to African-Americans, but I know that uh, it can impact. So what, what were you alluding to there? You know, knowing that I didn't really know about urology and as I've had the opportunity to uh, do public health screenings and do kind of lunch and learns or do prostate cancer awareness, one of the things that I realized that for African-Americans, it's really about the community. Uh, when you want to reach out and you want to get essentially buy-in from African-American males, a lot of times, you know, back in North Carolina, we had to really work with local churches, um, community groups in order to address things like prostate cancer. Well, one of the things that in urology you figure out is that, you know, there are a lot of conditions that affect uh, women as well, incontinence, kidney stones, right. um, you know, and then you have things like, you know, bladder cancer, kidney cancer. And in the South, there was a lot of smoking. So that was one of the things that we saw a lot. Uh, and one of the things that I think is great about urology is that we treat men, women, and children. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was about being able to, you know, you can help a wife with incontinence and urinary tract infections. You can help a, uh, the, the husband with an enlarged prostate or prostate cancer. You can help the children with things like bedwetting. You know, so as you look at it, there's so many different things we do. Uh, and it's really just understanding what your community is, what the needs are. A lot of these things we talk about are conditions that people deal with. You know, people wear diapers for years and years and years and pads because they don't even know that there's an option to sometimes medical treatments and surgical treatments mm -hmm. for dealing with incontinence. Mm -hmm. So the first element is being able to care about people and care about what impacts them and their families and their friends and things like that. And then it's really looking about solutions, looking for um, getting people to understand what their options are. And I think that's a lifelong endeavor when we think about ourselves as clinicians, because as much as we enjoy, you know, for you um, being able to do interventional cardiology, structural cardiology and fixing an issue. And I love robotic surgery or being able to help somebody with a kidney stone, with endoscopic surgery, being able to 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 take a stone out. If you don't build that connection if they don't understand really what you can offer and if they don't believe that you really care, then it's really difficult to be able to translate that technology into patient satisfaction, better right. you know, clinical outcomes and things like that. Again, I, I enjoy how you described all the different facets of your rise. Now, just for the record, um, as much as I love interventional, I ended up not being interventional. You're like, what? What are you talking about? No, I'm, I'm actually, I, I think it's even cooler. I'm a sports cardiologist, so, <laughs> which kind of fits, right? So I do fit this nutrition. So I do uh, sports cardiology. And that came about because as I was looking at interventional and saying, man, I, I really could engage due to some of my musculoskeletal issues from sports, it became more difficult and uh, various things like that. But I'm a, a sports cardiologist with the focus on prevention and we do tip of the spear performance uh, athletes, so tactical athletes, 
Um, we do folks who are like me, who, and, and I will say you, you still riding motorcycles across the country and playing volleyball and all that type stuff, <laughs> but who want to get back in, but know that, hey, I, I might have a couple of risk factors. Let me get checked out. And then we do folks from a rehabilitative standpoint. And, you know, what I like about sports cardiology is, I mean, I, I can engage at the elementary school level to the um, nursing home level. Right. Because I think fitness, movement and optimizing those things are key, no matter how old, young or even indifferent that you are. So in that, let's go ahead and, and hop into a topic that is near and dear to my heart. So and in, in, it's interesting, even when I was, um, as you can see, folks watching, I'm not in my home studio. But um, as I was talking to the hotel staff about using this room, the young man, one of the young men that let me in, a uh, tall, healthy guy. And he said, well, what are, what are you filming this for? I said, well, it's a podcast. We're going to be talking about prostate. Oh, my brother, my dad, they all had prostate cancer. They all had different surgeries. And I said, well, how have you been screened? He said, well, I didn't know to ask my doctor because I'm at higher risk. He was African-American. So then he said, well, I'm going to turn you over to another one of our team members. And, and he was a different ethnicity, an older gentleman. And we're talking and he's like, no, you're doing what? And I said, well, I'm doing a podcast with one of kind of our country's uh, leading urologists on the fight against pro prostate cancer. Well, they told me I have BPH and I take this and my dad. And it was just, I said, what in the world? And so from that, and I know those were just two individuals, but it tells me that prostate cancer, I know is the number one uh, cancer for, for males. Uh, but you know, that prevalence and incidence, whether it's increasing flat or staying the same, I know it's something that you felt impacted or, or you know impacts the African-American community. So talk a little bit about what prostate cancer is and, and why, and we can, we can transition into screening and, and how that's been a passion for you. Cause I know you've done some research. I've looked at some of the clinical trials you've worked on. You know, prostate cancer is the number one solid organ malignancy in men in this country. Um, and one in eight men get prostate cancer. And when we think about cancer, I always explain it to patients is it's really unregulated cell growth. Most of our organs, you know, have cells which, you know, grow um, and function. And prostate cancer is when you have abnormal growth of prostate cells and it's no longer regulated. And that pretty much fits into the context with cancer in general. The challenge with prostate cancer is it's really the model of a type of cancer that you really find much more effectively with screening uh, as opposed to with symptoms. And a lot of people think that, well, as long as I feel okay, I'm all right. You know, and I, I always relate it back to, you know, a lot of parallels with uh, cardiology and things like that. Um, I, you know, always say that it's like, kind of like hypertension. You know, people don't feel bad uh, until they have a stroke or a heart attack uh, many times, or if they did kind of feel a little bit differently, they just didn't really make the connection. Um, and similar with prostate cancer, it's one of those things that you don't feel uh, prostate cancer. So, you know, we're not really talking about screening at this point, but it is important to know what's going on in your body. And prostate cancer is just such a common place where cancers begin in men. Um, you know, and there are a number of risk factors for it, everything from ethnicity to age to genetics, family history. Uh, so, you know, being that it's so common out there and it so commonly affects African-Americans in a disproportionate fashion, for me, being a urologist is something that I obviously uh, thought for me was important to be able to make sure that I helped out from a community perspective with dealing with it. No, and, and I think, and you, you went about it the right way. That's, that's why I know you keep me, I was just so excited to hear about the studies, but you, you talked about the risk factors and you mentioned age and you mentioned ethnicity and you mentioned family history, you mentioned genetics. Then, you know, because I know a lot of people are saying, well, like you said, I, I feel good. I mean, I, there's no way I could have cancer. So what would be some of the symptoms that might prompt someone to talk to their doctor or to, to be concerned. And I know that in many cases, there may not be any. So what are some of the symptoms that folks should be concerned about? Yeah, I, you know, probably the best way that I've learned to get uh, people to think about prostate health 
is dealing with BPH. Now we know BPH is our fancy term for uh, enlargement of the prostate. We call it benign prostatic hyperplasia. And for men, as we get older, many times it becomes more and more difficult to urinate after about age 50 or so. That's a wonderful opportunity for dialogue with patients just about prostate health in general, because as men start to think, you know, I'm getting up more times at night to go to the bathroom than I used to, or the stream isn't as slow, or I have to go to the bathroom more frequently during the day, they start to understand that the prostate is a real organ and that, you know, it does have an impact on them. And then you can have further discussions about things like, you know, the, the appropriate way to screen, the age in which we want to screen. Um, so getting people to understand their body and different parts of it, I think, is one way. The other thing we always talk about is really working with family units. Uh, many times, um, you know, women are much better at utilizing healthcare resources. <laughs> and, you know, the, one of the things that I love in being a urologist is I treat a fair number of women as well. And it's always an opportunity, and I never miss that opportunity to ask them, you know, how their families are doing, how their husbands are doing. Has anybody made sure that their husbands are being taken care of or checked from a prostate cancer perspective? Because we know, according to the guidelines and their loose guidelines, doctors don't have to actually screen for prostate cancer. They're just supposed to have a shared decision-making conversation with patients. And that's one of the things that has been a real source of challenges for African-Americans specifically, because many times we don't even give the right information. Hold on now. Now you... Not uh, now, we have guidelines in cardiology. We have class one says you should do something. Class three says you shouldn't. Class two A and B gives you the option to 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 be flexible. But you just said, well, doctors just have to have a conversation. Hold on. Say that again, because I don't maybe I'm missing took because I think guideline tells you do this in this group of folks because we know they're at risk. Talk about that a little bit. You know, prostate cancer, even evaluation, the way we think about it and screening. You know, you look at uh, family physician uh, guidelines, internal medicine guidelines, American Cancer Society, and the AUA guidelines. And the only thing it's done over many, many years is confused a lot of people because depending on your perspective, whether or not you look at population health or individual patients, you know, people didn't know what to do with quote unquote broad based screening. It's a little bit more clear for like breast cancer screening, but for prostate cancer, you know, essentially it's been a complete shift over time. It went from way, we're not screening enough people, then people are basically uh, showing up with late stage prostate cancer to, oh my goodness, we're screening too many people. Why are we doing all of these PSAs and DREs and things like that? And, you know, really where they leveled out was it should be a shared decision-making discussion between a physician and a patient about risk and benefits. That makes a lot of sense when we look at literature from a medical perspective, and we assume that all physicians are then going to encourage patients to understand their options and risk. But the reality is that, you know, many patients get a conversation more along the lines of, well, we could check your PSA and screen for your prostate, and it's just something that you can have done, but you don't have to have it done. And a lot of men will say, oh, well, I'm good then, right? You know, I don't feel mad, so that's enough. Uh, and, you know, realistically, unless you really understand your risk and benefits of something and somebody cares to educate you, if you haven't educated yourself, you might miss that window of opportunity because let's face it, we know there's not enough physicians in this country. We know that people are dealing with hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, things like that. And many times things like prostate cancer screening take a little bit of a back seat because, you know, a physician may have 15 or 30 minutes for an office visit. And there may be a lot of things they have to work with for a patient that might have a number of medical conditions. And they're really going to try to address the things that at least on the surface appear to be the most germane. And then maybe they get to prostate cancer discussions and screening and things like that. Maybe they don't. It just depends. Wow. Man, that, that is so, so the onus, and I think about this, how many patients, and now my relationship with my patients is, uh, I won't say different, but I've had many of my patients for 15, 20 years, right? And so we have a relationship where they'll come in and they'll say, hey, my internal medicine doctor said X, or my family doctor said this, or what do you think? 
um, not because they're not worried about their heart, just because we we have that open communication. I mean, and uh, the good and bad of social media is my patients will con- communicate with me through there as well. And I'm laughing because sometimes it is these questions about, hey, they said I need a colonoscopy. Should I go and get? Yes. Right. And so uh, not understanding that, hey, I'm your heart doctor, but I like that we have that relationship. But I know for many patients, whether it is time, money, or just cultural differences that exist, having that conversation is difficult. So I'm going to ask you two questions. And I, and I know, uh, you know, it is, it's one of those things that's hard because there's tons of heterogeneity of differences amongst patients and physicians. So the first question is, as a patient, what do they need to say or, or how do they need to approach their position to be empowered to understand the risk benefits indications to screening and evaluating prostate cancer. And then the same question is, how can a physician uh, quickly, right? Because you mentioned time as being that rate limiting step, you know, articulate the risk benefits indication of screening for prostate cancer. Uh, and I know that's across the board, tons of different, but but to hear it from you, because I know you, you, as they say, put it where a ghost can get it, where it's simplified. How, how do those two groups meet in the middle somehow? Yeah, that's a great question. If I had my, my, um, my druthers, I would want to educate everyone about asking about prostate cancer, health and screening, uh, from a perspective of knowing what their options were. So from a patient perspective, you know, there's really two things we need to think about for prostate cancer screening. And I would like to make sure that our communities know, ask for a PSA and ask for a digital rectal examination. Now, you may or may not need one. Depending on your age, depending on what your treatments have been, maybe you know, you've know you already been treated for prostate cancer and you're under the care of a specialist and are taking care of it. You know, Maybe you're 20, you know? but the thing is, is that the 20 year old can start then thinking about what they need to do when they hit their 40s. Um, and then you know, uh, the other thing is that you know, once people know, yeah, it's a blood test, and it's a physical examination, that's kind of, that's easy. I mean, in a grand scheme of things, if you're kind of checking in with your physicians and you're getting care anyway, um, you should be getting blood tests to check for other things. And doctors should be touching patients. You know, it's important for patients to know because I have a lot of patients that come in and say, my doctor told me that they don't even check prostates anymore because there's no need to do so. And these are their uh, primary care physicians or internal mm-hmm. medicine physicians. Now, some do it because, uh, you know, they say, well, I know you're seeing a specialist. I'll let them check it. I'm more comfortable with them checking it. Some don't even check it anymore because when you look at their societies, it's a gray line, you know, about, you know, doing digital rectal examinations. Um, And that's just what I've had to accept. So I look for every opportunity to make sure community um, individuals know that they should be asking about can I have my PSA? Can I have my digital rectal examination? I'd like to know. Um, From a physician perspective, I always say, I love it. I love when patients do like what you said. They come in and say, should I get my colonoscopy? Should I get my this and that? I'm like, well, it's great because you know what? I have a relationship with them like you because that's one of the beautiful things about being a specialist that sees patients for many years and over a number of different conditions. I have the opportunity to build that relationship over time and I think that's really important. With respect to educating physicians as well, I always tell my primary care physicians when I go out and I talk with them about, you know, how do we work together about making sure right. that patients in our community are taken care of? I'm happy to do the digital rectal exams. I'm happy to do the PSAs for the patients that you'd rather refer on. You know, if you have any questions about it, I still think it's great for you to be able to do it. It's an opportunity to still bond with your patients and check And from our perspective, you might find something that's abnormal and then we will be there to back you up. So part of it is that I think physicians don't want to be out there kind of doing something they're not quite comfortable with and feel like they don't have backup. So just as much as I like to advocate for my patients, when I'm in a community, I like to go around and meet the primary care physicians and make sure that when they have questions, they know that there's somebody that they can interface with. If they're even on the fence, you know, one of the common things we see is not prostate cancer, but hematuria. They're like, oh right. man, I see hematuria again. Am I really going to have to go through this whole evaluation for a few red blood cells and a urine specimen that I check? I'm like, don't worry about it. I'll help you out with that. You know, 
just refer them out. You know, we'll have the conversation. We'll talk about the guidelines because they've gotten really confusing. Depends on how many red cells per high powered field, what their age is, what their gender is. You don't have to worry about that. It used to be really easy. They all got worked up. Now they're trying mm -hmm. to do things according to guidelines. So just let us take care of that for you. So I think part of it is really being a part of your community with your patients, as well as your other clinicians and making sure that your goal is to help everybody be able to understand things, which sometimes have become a little bit more complicated so that ultimately we can get the care to the people at the, at the time that they need it. No, I, and again, so wonderful. And I'm going to take that and just show that to the primary care doctors and the specialists, right? Because patients come in with questions all around and I, and I like how you articulated it, but I think the central point was community, whether it's a community of physicians, a community or, or relationships that you have with your patients. It's having a safe space where folks can talk about things or, or not feel uh, ashamed. I know that, you know, and, and maybe I shouldn't say people come up to my office all the time. I know you're busy. When they lead in with that, I, I can't say, yeah, you, you're right. You, you do know I'm busy, right? <laughs> but they come in and they say, can you, can you take a look at this EKG? Sure. Right. Because if they're concerned enough to walk, you know, up three, four flights of stairs and, you know, sneak in the back way. Cause my front desk staff, they won't let them back. They, they won't. so they, they find a way to sneak in and, and they looking around the corner, making sure my nurse doesn't get to them before I do. And if I see them, you know, we go through it and it's just good, you know, that, that they feel like, okay, I can reach out to, to Dr. Bass. He could talk through this EKG. Well, well we can talk all day and I, and I'm, Man, just enjoying the information. I think it's going to be very impactful for not only patients, but also providers. But now we get to um, an area where I'm not sure if it's a gray zone. I just know that there is a fair amount of difference or heterogeneity is is treatment. So let's say someone's gone through um, the, the PSA and, and found numbers have been elevated. Then they've gone on and uh, gotten a biopsy. I know they're, you know, to say, yep, you do have X based on this and we've confirmed it. Um, and, and I know I don't want to get to treatment first, but talk about, okay, we get the biopsy. What are they looking for and what do they find? And then we'll roll into treatment. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, essentially prostate biopsy is an office procedure that takes about 10, 15 minutes to do. And it's in response to an elevated PSA or an abnormal prostate examination, the physical examination, which is why it's so important to have those. And really what happens is we do the biopsy and we send it off to the pathologist and the pathologist takes, you know, a number of stains and uh, is basically looking for the, the composition of the cells that have been biopsied in the prostate. And there's really standard ways for them under a light microscope to know whether or not those cells look like they're cancerous or they're benign. And the important thing to know is that when it when we talk about cancer, there's all different rates of cancer, meaning uh, levels of aggressiveness of the actual cells. And then there's something that we call staging of cancer, where it's how extensive it is, whether or not it's in the individual organ or throughout the body. Uh, but essentially what we're looking for is to see if somebody has cancer in their prostate based upon the biopsies. And if they do, how aggressive it is or isn't. And from there, we can have discussions about what the appropriate treatments would be. Okay. And, and because a lot of my patients now on the cardiology side is, hey, I told them I can't do it because I'm on heart medicines. I'm taking aspirin or Plavix or blood thinners. And, you know, from my understanding that the bleeding risk is, is there and typically we will hold because I'm saying, if you have prostate cancer, you want to know, we can, we can take a part. Now, again, it depends. You know, if you just had stints and stuff like that, we and I won't get too much into the weeds, but there are ways that we say, hey, can we hold off on X to do Y? But what are some of the risks of biopsy? And I know that, um, you know, from a from a discomfort standpoint, people hear the word biopsy and get concerned. But can you talk about those risks to biopsy? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the 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 main risk of a prostate biopsy is the risk of some blood in the urine blood in the stool and blood in the semen for, you know, from a shorter period of time for maybe a day or two to a couple of weeks. Uh, probably the biggest risk is an infection in the bloodstream. We call it sepsis. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen that often, but it can happen because when you biopsy the prostate, there's a chance of somebody getting um, a urinary tract infection or, you know, bacteria in their bloodstream. But there are a number of things that we can do to kind of 
minimize that risk. Um, but, you know, part of it is that, yeah, it's scary when people hear about things like a biopsy. So usually I'll spend a couple of appointments just talking to them about, you know, uh, there are risks with it, but we're pretty good about being able to minimize that risk. And what I always tell patients is the beautiful thing about a biopsy in almost all cases, you can drive yourself here to my office and you can drive yourself home. Um, and we'll make sure that we get you set up to win so that you can do that. And a lot of times the patients hear, oh, okay, so I don't need to have like, you know, sedation or anesthesia or I need to go to the <laughs> hospital for it. They're a lot more comfortable with it. Uh, so that's usually what I'll kind of, you know, frame it for them in that sense. Uh, because almost all prostate biopsies you can do as an office procedure if you set your patients up the right way to succeed from the very beginning. Excellent. And, and, and that's reassuring because, like I say, when they come to me, you know, I hear biopsy and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, our intracardiac biopsies are a little more involved. So I'm saying, hey, we can come off this. We can take that. But even for me, it, it's good to know that you all have kind of minimized the the impact that it has on that patient's lifestyle. So we've taken the patient, articulated their risk, got their PSA. They've done plus minus the, the digital rectal exam, had the biopsy. And the biopsy comes back positive where, hey, it is cancer and, and we need to look at treatment. Can you talk about, and this is something I, I tried to, to read about, to, to list, hey, there's these treatment. I saw everything from hormone analogs to this, to that, to robotic. I said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to stop reading. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to stop reading about this. Cardiology is way easier than this. Talk a little bit about the different types of, of treatments and uh, just, to, you know, and then, you know, talk about your, your area of expertise where I can say, hey, so I know somebody that was a pioneer in X, you know, in, in, in this part of North Carolina, they, where we're both from. I, I know somebody that's a pioneer. So talk about those treatments. <laughs> OK, sure. I'm happy to do that. And I have to apologize. There was one question you asked, you asked me that I didn't answer. and It was about blood thinning agents and risk for bleeding with respect to yes. biopsies and things like that. And I wanted to, I did want to address that because that's where I think it is really good to make sure you have a good relationship with your other specialists and your other physicians in the community. Um, whenever I have a patient that's on a blood thinner, we know that there are a lot of percutaneous interventions that are being, uh, being done now for, you know, coronary artery disease and things like that. I always uh, make it as an opportunity to communicate with the patient's cardiologist. I always tell the patient, we're not going to do anything until we talk to your, uh, your cardiologist. Um, and many times I'll send the patient to their cardiologist so they can hear it again from their cardiologist um, so that they feel comfortable about, you know, because, you know, depending on when somebody had, you know, a percutaneous intervention or maybe a stent, maybe they're on, you know, a drug eluting agent, you know, whatever it may be, it's important to make sure that I don't play like I know best. Um, and I'm working with other people's uh, clinicians to make sure we optimize their opportunity for good care. Um, so that's many times as a way that we can allay concerns that patients have and also build that connection with the cardiologist because they're like, oh, that that urologist, he he thinks enough to respect me as a clinician. Exactly. This is not going to stop my blood thinning agent because he wants to do a biopsy. He's going to actually work with me. And that, you know, ultimately helps them feel comfortable to make sure that the next time they got a patient that can't void well, there's another issue. Hey, that's that urologist that's really thoughtful. Let me make sure if you get an opinion from them. Um, but, you know, that's, uh, I, I always think it's good to build goodwill on both sides of the equation with the patients, with the physicians, because that's where you're going to optimize care. Wonder. Um, with respect to the different treatments, this is one of the areas of prostate cancer that I think is really confusing for patients and clinicians, because we know on one hand, it's the number one cancer in the men um, for solid organ malignancies, and it's the number two cause of cancer-related deaths in men. But that being said, the majority of men with prostate cancer don't really need to be treated, at least initially, because when we think about the vast number of biopsies we do annually, which are millions, and the fact that most prostate cancer that's detected is relatively low grade and low stage, a lot of men are what's called active surveillance, and it's a monitoring program because when we do biopsies, we do a series of 12 biopsies commonly. And many times you might find very low grade cancer in one or two biopsies. And there's no question the guidelines are for those patients to do active surveillance and watch it. Now, it doesn't mean the patients can't make a choice that they want to do something more aggressive. 
But when you look at large pools of data, if you've got a PSA, which is a blood test, and it's very lowly elevated, like four and a half, and you've got one area of prostate cancer in 1% of the core in one biopsy, you know, those patients might do well with observing it, especially if they're maybe in their 70s or 80s or something like that. So what I always tell patients are, is that although the C word is extremely scary when people hear it, if you are somebody that does have prostate cancer, let's sit and talk about your options and we will talk about it as long as we need to until you understand what you have as different things that we can do about it. So that being said, a lot of patients, we can actually do active surveillance. And then we get into what are the treatments that basically can cure it. And then you have things like, you know, radiation therapy, and there's all different types of it. There's surgical intervention, there's all different types of that, you know, whether or not it's open, whether or not it's robotic, and then the different types of robotic. And that really gets too complicated for patients to <laughs> understand initially, unless they're, you know, clinicians themselves. But what I always say is, for almost all types of prostate evaluations, we have a solution for you. And the reality is it's very rare that, um, well, not very rare, but most men do not die from prostate cancer. From, um, they die because of other issues, which is why I always reinforce them. I'm your prostate cancer specialist, but I want to make sure that you are dealing with your heart conditions, you know, your smoking, if you have you know, obesity, if you have diabetes, let's make sure that we're talking about that too. And I'll spend time talking about, hey, what is your hemoglobin A1C? Um, okay. You know, what has your cholesterol been? Because uh, I noticed that you're not having really good erections right now. And, you know, maybe you don't think about your high cholesterol and your hypertension because you don't feel it, but this is actually, you are feeling it now uh, mm -hmm. because you have other issues. But getting back to the prostate cancer treatments, that part's pretty easy. It just takes really, you got to be able to sit down and talk with people and let them know that, you know, there's a, there's a limited number of treatments and it's really about the right treatment at the right time for the right patient. And we're going to work through this until you're comfortable with ultimately what we're going to decide to do based upon what we found with your biopsies. I mean, wonderful answer. I mean, and you, you said it's confusing unless you're a clinician. No, I literally, I pulled a a JAMA article that was a review. And I said, okay, it was 2017. It was a great review, but I said, okay. So then it was another article from Lancet in 2021, read through that one in preparation for our discussion. I said, okay, well, this is a little different Then, okay, that's different. And then there was another article from 2020. I said, you know what? I'm done. I'm done at this point because I saw everything from the Luda night. I don't even know. And I said, this is, but, but the fact was, but, but the one central theme that I saw is Exactly what you just said, and I think you encapsulated it well, finding the right treatment for the right patient at the right time, right? In in all the articles, even though they span the course of many years and, and a host of different, you know, research inputs, that was the focus, the very patient-centered approach, which, and, and I'm not saying this isn't the case for other uh, surgical specialties, but certainly um, this is in urology, at least in those articles, in those they were review articles, that was the goal to say, okay, what fits your lifestyle? What fit, what is the right fix based on where you are? Um, now I'm going to go back, then we're going to go forward. Then I know you, you got to run, but, um, so going back now, you mentioned uh, a low grade and you said four for the PSA. And I don't know if there are there cutoffs to where someone should be concerned or what is a normal PSA, just so when folks are listening, they can say, OK, mine is one. So that's good for me. And I know it based on age and risk and all that. Could you go through that and then we'll hop into an area you talked about? But I'm, I'm happy you mentioned it and then go right ahead with the PSA. PSA can be confusing, but let's break it down and make it as simple as we can. In general, if your value is over four, it should be a pause with a little bit more investigation. Okay. Um, it's true that in certain ages, some of the guidelines say you can go up to six and a half. And then for younger men, you know, in their forties, we'll typically use lower cutoffs. We'll usually say, if you're in your forties, we don't really want it above two and a half. If you're in your fifties, we don't want it above three and a half. Um, but I tell patients, Focus on the four value. Things that are under four tend to be a little bit better because most men aren't really into their, you know, 50s and 60s when they're getting screened anyway. Um, so just for a simplicity, I would say use that as your cutoff. But if you are younger, we probably want to start a little bit, you know, earlier and maybe a little bit lower value. 
No, and and I, so thank you. That is great because just as you, when they come to see you and you talk about their hemoglobin A1C, and you talk about their blood pressure and you say, hey, are you having erectile dysfunction? I do the same thing, right? And, and because they don't make that link that how you live or your lifestyle in terms of what you eat, how much you exercise, how much you relax. I mean, this morning my back was hurting. I did yoga, right? So it, it's those type things that impact how you do, particularly when you have a family history or genetics of a, a solid tumor or malignancy. So in that, um, and you know, I'm a lifestyle guy, right? I'm a fitness guy. Have you seen some of the benefits for your patients who either are at risk for prostate cancer or who've had prostate cancer that have changed their lifestyle? Now, I'm not going to go on my diatribe about the benefits of a whole food vegan diet. That's another conversation, even though we know that. But have you seen some of those benefits um, where you've counseled the patient to say, hey, maybe drink less alcohol or stop smoking in improving their prostate cancer risk and or or their life, you know, with prostate cancer. Okay, we're going to, have to do another one of these. We have to talk about blue zones and how we uh, ultimately get people living longer. Okay? okay, now you now you said it. I just was down in Costa Rica and uh, talked about that. There's a book by by Doctor Day, who's a cardiologist, had some issues that where I got interested in blue zones. So I'm I'm a blue zoner. I'm, I don't live there. You know, there's one in California, Loma Linda, but we got to talk. Linda. Okay, all right, okay. We'll talk about that. Yeah, you know, so it's always been a little bit gray when you look at the literature over many years with respect to the specific prostate cancer development and you relate it back to diet and things like that. We know that clearly age, ethnicity, family history, genetics play into prostate cancer risk factors. Over years, they've looked at things like calcium, selenium, lycopenes, the list goes on and on, flaxseed, all types of things. And what is the risk to prostate cancer development. And to be honest with you, the data has been kind of all over the map, depending on what the study was designed to show and whether or not there were one or two variables and things like that. There's probably some data to suggest that things like, you know, high calcium levels and um, uh, high body mass index because you have different, a different hormonal milieu within your body right. uh, can probably cause uh, maybe a little bit more prostate cancer. And then when you look at people with diabetes, you know, they might be, in some studies it shows they may be a little bit less likely to develop it, but if they do develop it, then it's going to be higher grade. So, you know, what I always say is the most important thing is that having a healthy lifestyle overall is going to optimize your body's ability to fight anything off. And we know that, you know, cancers in general um, are things that, Whatever treatment we're going to do, whether or not it's going to be surgery, whether or not it's going to be radiation, whether or not it's going to do chemotherapy, whether or not it's going to be just supportive, you know, active um, surveillance, the better shape you're in, the better opportunity you have for your body to be able to uh, continue to function. And I always go back to patients and say, again, if you've got a BMI of, you know, 28, and if you've got really a hemoglobin A1C of 11 or 12 or 14, mm. our prostate cancer discussion is probably not going to be really that important because you're going to have other issues that you need to deal with. They're going to be much more impactful for your life. Mm -hmm. But even if we do want to get back to treating your prostate cancer, it's really difficult for me to operate on somebody who has a very high BMI or has a you know really high hemoglobin A1C, even if they want to. I saw one of my friends the other day who He's 500 pounds and he was diagnosed with high grade prostate cancer and came mm. to see me as a second opinion. And, you know, we'd always had that weight discussion and healthy lifestyle discussion. He was like, well, I want you to take this prostate cancer out. I said, you were 500 pounds. I said, you're not going to be able to go to surgery right now to say, and for him, it was like a light bulb that went off mm. because all of a sudden it became very real. He's like, wow, this is, this is now, this is limiting my opportunity to do something that fundamentally I would want to do. And I see other people doing for the management of prostate cancer. Um, so, you know, again, it always goes back to, we're still working through, we know that better diabetes control, um, better obesity control optimizes and maybe decreases prostate cancer development and the manifestations of it. But overall, 
it's been really difficult for us to identify specific dietary factors that clearly link to it. But we do know that in general, when people have a healthy lifestyle, they do better with their prostate cancer and they do better with the treatments and they live longer in general. So you that's it. See, you, you put it perfect. I mean, I'm gonna have to bring you with me when I, whenever I go talk to these other places, because they, because people want to battle, and I just try to say this is in a fight. If you live better, you're gonna do better going into whatever you're going into. Your, your body, you, you're building resilience in your body in that space. Well, it has been wonderful speaking with you and 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 co- reconnecting and the blue zone conversation. I can't wait to hear that. But if you had three, four, five key takeaways. If you said, you know, if we lost this whole recording, which is gold, by the way, but if you had three or four key takeaways for folks with respect to urologic health or or specifically prostate health, what would they be? I would say, know your options about prostate cancer screening and ask for it. That's number one. I would say, have a healthy lifestyle in general. It's so important. I don't care what your medical condition is, prostate, bladder, whatever, have a healthy lifestyle. That's really important. I'd say, think about your family's health needs, whether or not you're the father, whether or not you're the mother, whether or not you're the child, you are a family unit and you have to look out for one another. The dad needs somebody to go with them to, you know, office appointments or to schedule their office appointments, then do it. You know, if the mom needs somebody to cover some of them at home so she can go do her stuff, then do it. And then the next thing is be part of a community. You know, care about your your friends, your family members. I can't tell you how many men don't even know that their friends had prostate cancer because they don't talk about it. And that that is, to me, that's a breakdown in us as a community because we know we talk about sports, right? <laughs> we know we talk about, you know, the latest thing was on Netflix or, mm-hmm. or whatever, you know, so... Let's figure out a way to continue to talk about the things that ultimately are important. We always talk about our community. We need to be talking more about finances, was building, you know, finance, financial literacy. We need to talk more about health literacy. We need Mm -hmm. to talk, you know, more about becoming a community that helps the community grow. So, you know, that's another point that I would take from it. Um, And, you know, the last thing I would say is that it's just important to get good health care annually. And that's you, you can ever you can never underestimate the value of that. Find a good doctors. And if you find doctors that don't advocate for you, then find another physician. Because really that's what's important to do. Wow. Well, I found I found my urologist, so I'm not even worried. I mean, I'm, I'm I mean, I'm good. I mean, I and and I say that jokingly, but he knows and, and I appreciate the relationship that he's allowed me to have with him because I know he is super busy. But whether it's a text on a Saturday night that someone's called me and I don't know the answer to or whether it's even, you know, some of my own concerns that I've had based on my family history. You know, Dr. Bruno has been not only um, a consummate professional, but also a friend. And I think that's that's the one thing that when you spoke about community that really resonated with me. But, you know, as we as we come to a close and I look forward to our next meeting, I want to first thank you and, and just let you know all the appreciation that both myself and my audience has to, to the information that you've given. I know that it you know will touch multiple lives with respect to folks understanding and being empowered from a urologic standpoint. And again, if there's anything we can do to to spread the message or anything I can do to help your patients with cardiovascular questions, uh, just let me know, my friend. Just let me know. So thank you. No problem. Well, as you all know, this is Dr. Vass with the About That Life podcast, the podcast about life or living intentionally forever. Today, we talked about prostate issues, urologic issues, learned about community. But not only did we do that, but we reached and and, and got to a place where we felt connected. Connected understanding that prevention is key with whatever that health is. But prevention starts with you. Starts by living a healthy lifestyle and despite what the data says that may not be clear, we know that the healthier you are going into something, the healthier you'll be coming out. So as we close, remember to live intentionally forever.